Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week, I'm kind of flying solo because, well, size in Morocco at the moment, doing a bit of bike packing, and I really hope it's not raining out there, mate. Anyway, this week on the show, we've got gravelly rings, aero bars, flashy paintwork, new gravel tech, plus, has tech gone too far? Right then, John, what is hot in the road bike tech world this week? Well, first up is the announcement from Mavic that they've just launched a whole new range of gravel-specific parts. In amongst that is four new wheel sets, which are all tubeless compatible. And importantly, or I think, there's actually a hookless rim design, which means that when you want to put your tires on, it's just a little bit easier because, yeah, they can be a bit problematic, can't they? Uh, also, they've just launched, in amongst them, Mavic's first 650B road wheel set. Yeah, so Mavic has emphasized that the wheels actually use a traditional construction. So the spoke nipple is inserted into the rim rather than the spoke threading into a threaded insert inside the rim. And apparently this is gonna be great for comfort. Yeah, because of course the 650B wheel is slightly smaller in diameter. So in theory, it's gonna give you a more harsh ride, isn't it? In theory, at least. And well, if you're riding a gravel bike, in theory, the terrain should be giving you a more harsh ride as well. So yeah. a little, any steps for comfort are probably <laughs> yeah. a good thing. So interestingly too, there is actually a pair of wheels in that range with rim brakes on. So rim brakes aren't dead. But if rim brakes are not your thing and you're using discs, then all of those hubs are actually using center lock disc rotors. Uh, and the prices are pretty good. Start at $300 and go up to 1,000. So for a top of the range wheel set, I think that's a pretty good price, isn't it? They've also, John, made some new all-road gravel tyres to complement the wheel range. So they are available in 30, 35 mm and 40 mm width. And the 40 mm tyre, being the widest of it, I think, you know, rolling resistance is a really valid concern when you get mm. to tyres that wide, especially if you're using off-road and on-road. And Mavic has got a really nice kind of slick centre tread to that tyre, so possibly not all that much of a concern. No. And also, they don't have a 650B tyre yet for those wheels, do they? They don't, but word is they are working on some. So oh, that's watch the space, I guess. Yeah. And finally, they've actually got a new range of clothing out as well. The all-road range of clothing. Now, I never actually knew such a thing existed. I thought that when you went off-road, basically you carried on wearing Lycra and possibly got laughed at by like the cool mountain bike guys, or you wore some baggy mountain bike stuff. Personally, I think that the collared retro sort of style look. It's not really for me. I get a bit hot under the collar, but um, yeah, you know, fair play to them for getting some all-road clothing out there. I think, it's a, I think it's quite a cool look. I think if you think back to like, the 50s when you were riding the Tour de France and a road was pretty much a gravel road, it's yeah. a good, good and relevant throwback for me. Well, then, Another yeah. product that is built around increasing comfort, kind of like we were talking about Mavic's wheels, is the shock stop suspension seat post. Oh. Now, it has 35 millimeters of travel built in, and you can adjust the preload. Yeah, and you can change those springs around as well, can't you, to actually adjust that suspension, which is a nice little idea. I might get one actually, mate, for my commute, because I've got dozens of potholes and I take an absolute pounding. Um, but the weight of it, weight weenies, you're not gonna be very happy about this. 500 grams, which is fairly heavy, isn't it, for a seat post, but I suppose it has got suspension built in it, so. It's not all lost, um, but it does also come with different shims, so it fits in variety of different frames and also different saddle clamps too. So if you've got some oval rails, you're good to go with the shock stop. I think the weight's an interesting point though because it's not a product which is designed to, say, to save weight, it's a product which is designed to add functionality to your mm. bike. So yeah, as like you said, the weight saving should just be expected. The shock stop is also a Kickstarter project and it has already exceeded its target by five times with about 25 days to go, which is clearly hugely impressive. And also means if you want a suspension seat post, you should probably head over and back it. Yeah, they've absolutely smashed that target. Well, well done. done. More tech later. I'm joined by Mr. Tom Last. He's back in the GCN tech set. And do you know what, Lasty? I've been thinking recently. I know it's a shock, but basically every time I read a press release, I think to myself, well, that's it. We can't go any further because tech has just been pushed to the limit. But then, you know, it's back to square one again almost when the next thing gets released. Well, for a, basically a bike tech geek like you, John, I'm a bit surprised to that because I wouldn't have thought you would be questioning whether tech had gone too far or whether we should set a limit, I would have thought you would have been sketching up your ideas to say, well, this is how we take it further. 
It's funny you mention actually about a sketchbook because I do have a notebook somewhere in the depths of a, of a box with some ideas on how to improve things, but that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole different story. But I'm actually thinking about, say, last week when we talked about Campag and a 12-speed group set, you know, another sprocket, do we actually need it? I mean, as nice as it is, and it's obviously in demand, otherwise they wouldn't do it, or enough people want that next little level of progression, but is it really needed? Well, I think first, the first answer to that is people definitely said the same thing when we went from seven speed to eight speed, eight speed to nine speed, nine speed to 10 speed, and you definitely notice the difference between a seven speed and a 10 speed yeah. bike. And I think that bike tech progress and just technological progress is good. I'm really optimistic about it. There are technologies getting better and better. It's allowing people to ride further. Maybe they wouldn't have been able to. And even if you can already ride that far, it's maybe making your ride marginally more comfortable. Plus tech's kind of a nice thing to be interested in. So in answer to your question, I think that while a 12 speed cassette may not strictly be necessary to get most of us up a hill or up that really steep gradient. If you like it, that's good. Absolutely. I mean, every time I go to a big bike show, like Eurobike, Taipei bike show, that kind of thing, I'm absolutely blown away with what's presented to me from the weird to the wonderful, and you know, to that lightweight component that we get shown. But I'm actually wondering, going back to my original question, about has tech gone too far? I honestly don't even think we've scratched the surface so far. Yeah, I think that's possibly a very, very good point. Like what could be next? A few years ago, we probably couldn't have seen wireless shifting or electronic shifting. So down the line, are we gonna see 13 speed, 15 speed, electromagnetic gears, a helmet with automatically closing vents? Do you know what? Thinking about it, remember graphene? So a couple of years okay. ago, that was you know the hot buzzword, wasn't it? dubbed as the next door new carbon fibre. And well, other than a few Vittoria tyres and those frames from Dassey, we've not actually seen it, have we? We haven't seen it yet. No, you're but right. Perhaps the next big thing, John, could be the one-spoked wheel idea. Ha ha, very funny. Look, that was Lloydie's idea anyway. Do you know what? I think we should get in quick here, John, and patent the one-spoke wheel. Now you're talking. But, I mean, in seriousness, I think that the evolution of these products is gonna be basically the growth of these new genres of cycling that we're seeing. So at the moment, the key one is definitely gravel, isn't it? Or whatever you wanna call it. Whereas probably 10 or 15 years ago, it was the reintroduction, certainly of fixed wheel riding, wasn't it? When we saw components and parts in all different colors, shapes, weird, wonderful sizes, apparently, uh, that fixie scene is still as big as ever as well. I mean, I'm a velodrome man. I'm not certainly not a street fixie cool guy or whatever you want to call them. Well, I think, John, what you raise is a really interesting point because what we see is the development of niches within cycling and the technological developments within those niches can actually benefit us all, which yeah, is a definitely. good thing. So gravel riding, even if gravel riding isn't your thing, it's likely that the more road bike friendly hydraulic disc brakes or the kind of different shifting systems that are developed there will benefit you as a road rider down the line. Mm. The fixed gear street scene that you that you mentioned, you know, it's made fixed gear bikes or track bikes a little more accessible because they ultimately had to become cheaper because more people wanted them. Yeah. Again, a good thing. But it does leave us wondering what your opinion is. So make sure you tell us what you think down below. Has bike tech really gone too far? Should we have just caught it quits 30, 40 years ago with down tube shifters? and steel frames, or are we in a much better place now with carbon fiber frames, tubeless tires, wireless electronic shifting, and hydraulic disc brakes? I yeah. think the answer is possibly quite obvious. Yeah, to some people, definitely. But let us know your thoughts. So last week, Sai and I asked you the question, what makes a super bike super? And as ever, you've been getting stuck into the comments. Take it away, Tom. Yeah, the, so the first one we pulled out here, John, is Ravine Premji, who says, Superbikes, agree with Sai. Middle ground, buy a bike with a good frame and spend some extra on upgrading the wheels and tyres, which are the most dynamic pieces of the bike. Yeah, can't argue that. I've always got to agree with that. New wheels always make a big difference. Next up, Shlomo Shaw. That's a cool name, isn't it? Uh, it's not the bike, it's the rider. And yeah, 100% agree with that. My dad once said to me, 1987, Stephen Roach would have won that Tour de France on a butcher's bike. Not sure he would have done, but you know what we mean. Best rider yeah, he tends, was, to, tends to win, don't they? Despite what equipment they've got. Yeah, but you know, getting the best equipment is also kind of nice. Oh yeah. So next up we've got another one from Earthstick who's really backing up Ravine's previous point. He says, it's true that upgrading wheels makes a notable difference to a bike. It does. I have a pair of Mavic Axioms on a bike 
and they're very sturdy and capable, but when I swap them out for another aluminium pair, which are 500 grams lighter, the bike suddenly feels much quicker, faster to accelerate, easier up hills, and generally much less effort. It's transformed my bike into a much more serious tool. If I'd had a superbike from a decade ago with carbon wheels at 500 grams lighter, and that immediately felt effortless again, any more super, and I don't think I'd even have to pedal. <laughs> I, see, I disagree, because I think what you've actually highlighted there, Earthstick, is like this kind of, it's almost like the diminishing returns of getting used to your really nice bike. So when you oh, first yeah. get an amazing bike, or like when you first save up your kind of money from your weekend job and buy a really, really super light pair of wheels, you put them in your bike and you notice it. Like you said with the Axioms and the other wheels, it feels like you're flying along. Yeah. But when you've been, and it is a hugely fortunate position to be in, when you've ridden that a few times, suddenly that becomes the new normal. So I think your suggestion of having some stuff to train on and then some stuff for best, that really helps you to enjoy. Yeah, I everything. always did that. I always used to train on a really bad pair of wheels, to be honest with you. They were so heavy. And then put the nice ones on for a race. Anyway, uh, Joe Clear. Clear pick. Uh, when I upgraded from a bottom of the range bike to a top mid range bike, I instantly felt faster and the whole riding experience changed unexplainably dramatically. Uh, however, now that they ride it all the time, it still feels quick and amazing to ride. However, it becomes the norm over time and you only really notice that big difference when you hop back on your cheap bike. That explains the exact point we've just made, doesn't it? Far more eloquently and articulated. <laughs> <laughs> significantly better, Joe, so thanks for saving me there. Next up, John, and this is our last one from, from last week. This is from Mark Rooms, who says, for elite level riders, the small differences of a superbike may be a world of difference when it comes to results. True, that's where Sky's kind of much spoken about marginal gains philosophy comes in. For the average rider, a superbike is more about pride of ownership. A mid-range bike with upgraded wheels makes sense. You also have the advantage of a spare set of wheels for training or bad weather. Yeah, yeah, spot on, Mark. Can't disagree, can't, can't disagree with Dis that. Disagree with any of that. Right. So, you know, we need to close this section with reminding you again, let us know what you think. Has Bike Tech gone too far? Tell us in the comments, because we'll be reading out a few of our favorites next week. And we'll also be getting stuck in in the comments too. Yeah, we certainly will. Right, first up, some tech from last weekend's Amstel Gold Race. And interestingly, on the winner's bikes, that's Michael Valgren of Astana, he was spotted using Ceramic Speed's oversized pulley wheel system. So essentially, that's where you replace the cage of the rear derailleur and those pulley wheels with something quite a bit bigger. Uh, now, the reason behind that is to reduce the friction. And interestingly, Astana aren't actually sponsored by Ceramic Speed, so Valgren, he must believe in that. So there we are. Now, there's no actual photos I could find of him using it in Amstel Gold, but I did see him on TV, like I said. Uh, but here is a picture of him racing with it earlier on in the season. So mark my words, he has been using it. Staying with ProTech, and Aqua Blue Sport in particular. So, they started off this season using the Veloflex Vlaanderen tubular tyres in a 27 millimeter width that I did actually get to see in Dubai. Now, midway through the season, or at least almost midway, they've made a change to Pirelli of all brands, so more commonly seen with motorsport. And interestingly, they've gone up a millimeter, so to 28 millimeter wide tubular tires. And yeah, tubular, I said. No one has seen them yet from Pirelli, so there we are. More news on those once I get to find out. I couldn't help but notice some pretty fancy looking Oakleys on the face of Alejandro Valverde and just check them out. What do you think of them? Let me know in the comments down below. Now, they look to be either sticker bombed, but more than likely, I reckon here, they're actually hydro dipped. So that's a process where you lay a film onto some water and then you spray an activator on it and then you dip that product in carefully and remove it. And then that film sticks and applies there. Mm. I do like a custom pair of sunglasses. Now, a final bit of painted tech. Check out the bike of Miguel Lopez of Astana. Apparently that bike is called the Superman Lopez. Absolutely love it. Uh, the design inspiration is the Colombian Sunset, and the idea behind it is to inspire him when racing. If someone gave me that, I would go much faster, that's for sure. It looks so cool. Uh, apparently the folks at Argon 18 have got more collaborations and fancy colors coming soon, so keep an eye out. We will too, and we'll definitely report back, especially if they look as cool as this. Now for some ProTech that I reckon we're gonna be quite unlikely to see on any pros bikes soon. Uh, Eastern have just launched some new gravel shifting chain rings. 
they're a first for me. And now these chain links are direct mounts, so they don't use a traditional spider. Instead, they sit in behind the right hand crank and they attach there with a lock ring. Rather than using uh, the extra material of a spider and also chain ring bolts, they should be a little bit lighter weight too. But why have they done this? Well, Eastern don't think that one by is suitable for all gravel or cyclocross riders. Instead, two by is still a solution. So with their three different offerings, they believe they've got a solution for virtually everyone out there. So think of this as a traditional two by chain set and essentially being a super compact chain set. And those three ratios, well, we've got 46, 32, 47, 30, and 46, 36. I do like the look of those. Now finally, a Kickstarter to end tech of the week. And this is the Billy Bars. Uh, it's essentially like a base bar that mounts into your stem and then you can attach different handlebar ends to basically make the handlebars of your choice. So drop bars, riser bars, flat bars, that kind of thing. Why you would want to do that, I do not know. However, there is a reason behind why they've done this. And the purpose is, is that you can take off those extensions, meaning that you can store your bike a lot easier. So if you're very, very, very confined for space, I can imagine this being quite a good solution. Personally, uh, even with quite a few bikes, I'm still not at that stage yet. But hey, with 15 days to go, they're nearly at their funding target. So there must be enough people out there who warrant it as a good idea and hats off to them for trying it. So last week, we inducted the Ambrosio Nemesis rim, which is certainly an iconic piece of tech. And this week, well, I've got something pretty special for you. Aluminium 2, and it's these. The Scott drop-in handlebars in the flesh. Just look at them. Now, in my humble opinion, these are the most iconic handlebars in the last 30 years to have been used. And they were really brought to the forefront by Greg LeMond, a tech trailblazer himself, who we have mentioned on the GCN Tech Show quite a few times. I mean, after all, he won two World Road Race titles and three Tour de France's. He introduced us loads of different tech. Now they're made by ski company Scott and were first seen in the 1990 Tour de France, which Le Monde went on to win. But why were these bars actually so special? Well, they allowed him to get low, narrow, and importantly, aero. We also saw other riders use them too, such as Yashislav Yekimov, who basically put some tri-bar extensions on the bottom of the handlebars and then allowed him to get a pretty, well, I don't know what to say about that position, but let's face it, it probably worked for him. He was good against the clock. Sadly though, these bars did in fact fall out of favor in the Peloton in the mid to late 90s. But amazingly, I, to my knowledge, they're still not actually banned. If they are banned though, do let me know in the comment section down below. And also leave me your suggestions for the Wall of Fame down there in the comments. Last week, I decided to put head to head two of the less commonly spotted bikes of the Pro Peloton. We had the Steven Zenon against the KTM Revelator Sky DMP. And well, this one has been the closest vote yet. And with 51% of the votes, yep, it was the KTM. Wow, so there we are. If you paint your face on your head tube, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna win Bike of the Week. Now this week's Bike of the Week competition is between the two winning bikes of the Amstel Gold Race. So in the turquoise corner, first up, we've got the bike of Astana. We've got the Argon 18. Now it's equipped with a full Shimano Jorace Di2 group set, power to max power meter, Corima wheels, and that's up against the bike of Chantel Black of Bowles Dolmans. So we've got a specialized S-Works Tarmac SL6 disc. Now that is a mouthful. And it's got SRAM Red HRD ETAP. We've got zip wheels, a quark power meter. Oh, I tell you what, this one I think is gonna be close too. You know what to do, vote up there in the corner for your bike of the week. And next week we'll have two more head to head. I'm lucky enough to be joined by Mr. Tom Last once again, and this time he's gonna help me judge whether bikes are nice or super nice inside the bike vault. And uh, sadly, he's found that bell. It's back. Let's go, John. Yeah, right, okay. Well, first up this week is Asker Rubek Sorensen, uh, and he is from Denmark. I believe it's a little island actually called Bornholm. And well, this is his Vision uh, Twin Tech road bike. It's a nice looking bike, isn't it, that? I'm you know he's a junior racer, by the way. That explains why he's got quite a small outer chain ring. You know what, John? I think I'm going to give him a super nice. 
It is super nice, actually. Look how clear that. You ready? Yeah. This is super nice. It's, the bike is a super nice. Right, let me just Next clear bike. a few things up. You're meant to ring it holding on to that anyway. Next one. <sighs> right. Okay. Next up, Ho Chun Yung from Hong Kong Airport. Cannondale, I do like that. I think, the, you see, for me, the photo is, is less about the bike there. It is a nice bike, but I, yeah, I think it's just a nice for me. Really? Yeah. I quite like it because it looks like he's somewhere he shouldn't be. Look at that barbed wire and stuff. It's still just a nice. Well, it's, it's, yeah. a nice it's a very nice yeah. photo. It is a nice photo, and it's got the majority. So, Ho Chung, it's just a nice, I'm afraid. Well, it's still a nice bike, isn't it? Very right. Nice. Now, another Danish entry. This is Mikkel Olsen. Yeah. Sent in his Ridley Phoenix SL. It's super nice. It's yeah. an easy one, that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But That's super nice, skin mate. Wall well, skin nice. wall tires. Nice yeah. paint job. Easy, easy decision. Next, yeah. next photo. Simple. Right. Nico uh, Matthijsson on the Gulpenberg. That's one of the Amstel Gold Race climbers, isn't it? Is, yeah. uh, BMC Team Machine. He's got himself some DT Swiss. Straight 1400 Red, wheels, yeah. Hydro. Yeah, Quark Power Meter. Conti tyres, Physique Saddle. All black, Yeah. looks stealth. The bike is, without a doubt, super nice. The, yeah. ang the hoods are angled up pretty severely. Yeah, I'd like to rotate those bars personally for my own riding style. I mean, but the bike's yeah, it's just another super nice, Yeah, isn't it? super nice, you basically. Can't read the bike. Yeah. Well, absolutely super nice, mate. Um, right, next up, I like to throw in a curveball. This is Simon Richardson in Morocco, and this is his, what's that, 3 2 Explorer, isn't it? It is. Well, it's. It looks like he's moving house. He's carrying rather a lot of kit with him. Yeah. Um, that's really cool again, isn't it? I mean, I don't know. I, it pains me to give Simon yeah, super nice. Same with me. But the bike is super nice, so. Yeah, super nice. And the final one this week is from Tim Harris of Perth in Australia. Well, not, that is not in Australia, that image. No, it's definitely not in Perth in Australia. It's actually in southern France where he lives. And he's got himself one of those fancy treks. You've got one of those, haven't you? Yeah, that's the Trek Project 1, which means that Tim has designed it himself and commissioned the paintwork from Trek. And it's then, I've seen it, it's all done in-house at their factory in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm very partial to that, John. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Why didn't you go through flames? Um, I think because the initial colourway I suggested with flames was not in particularly good taste, so I moderated it back, and I got a flame-like effect with the nice orange to yellow fade, which I love. So, yeah, super nice. Yeah, super Easy nice for me too, yeah. Well done, Tim. Oh, that bell, honestly, shivers down my spine each and every time. So, John, if people want to get their bike into the GCN Tech Bike Vault next week, what do they do? Do you have to submit it using the email address on screen and include a little bit about the bike and also where you come from so we can give you a big shout out. Be patient though, we have had thousands and thousands of, of uh, people sending in their pictures. We certainly have. Inundated. Them. All right, so that's it, I'm afraid. We're nearly at the end of the show, but what's coming up for you this week? Well, on Friday, I take a visit to Bristol Bespoke, so that's a handmade bike show, lots of fancy bits going on there. Saturday, I got to check out the training bike of Alexis Ryan of the Canyon Shram team. Keep your eyes peeled for that one. On Sunday, we've got a geek edition. Monday, I'm back in here in the workshop showing you how to fit cartridge bearings. Then on Wednesday, here for the tech clinic, helping solve your problems. Remember as well to give this video a like, a share, a thumbs up, tell all your friends all about it. Also, remember to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. And then for another great video, the latest tech clinic, click just down here.